the reality is there is no such thing. So let's start with a thought a problem. What is Japan? Turn to the people around you. Five minutes, come back, tell me, what is Japan? What is Japan? Take a moment. Japanese, use Japanese, use English, use Chinese, use anything. Five minutes, what is Japan? Exactly the same as the people at the Shiratoko Peninsula? Uh, no. no. Okay, so we're back. What is Japan? So, this is why we want to think carefully when we use words like culture. If you tell me it's a language, I'm going to say, so then you're telling me that uh, Kansai ban and Yuzu ban and all the other versions are all the same, they're all equal. If you tell me that it's a group of people, a homogenous group of people, you know what I'm going to say, right? I don't even have to you know, ask you about Ainu, Emishi, Furakami. So it's not a unified group of people, it's not a unified language. The only thing we could say is it is a current geopolitical entity. It consists of a group of islands that have a united political system off the coast of Asia. That's about it. But that's about as meaningful as saying that the United States consists of a uh, bunch of area in North America with Hawaii and Alaska thrown in. It really doesn't tell us anything. Cultural studies, which is where we're going to begin, is the attempt to look at the variety of frames that go into a culture. And it is also an attempt to use methods, different methods, to examine various aspects of culture. Um, this is a significant undertaking for two reasons. Number one, knowledge is always useful. But number two, if we want to talk about something in a meaningful way, then we have to be able to analyze it and understand it. How many times have we heard the phrase, uh, Japan is a homogeneous nation, we're all one group of people, blah, 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 blah. This is a cultural myth, and as a cultural myth, it's very valuable, because it tells us not about the reality, but what the people think. But as a reality, no. any more than if someone said, America is a country where everybody is free, blah, blah, blah. So what is, what are cultural studies um, themselves? Cultural studies is an academic discipline that began uh, in Britain, actually, in the 1950s, a group of professors who were at the same school in London began to ask some of the same questions that we're asking in the post World War II world, you know, talking about Britain. What is Britain? What is what does it mean to be English? Or what does it mean? Um, we began to realize that okay, if I walk down the street of London, here's a curry restaurant, and here's a Pakistani curry restaurant, an Indian curry restaurant. And so, what does it mean anymore to use terms like England, English, British, American, rather than uh, simply dismiss the idea? They said, let's try to apply some of the disciplines from other areas where they had already worked. Um, what's called archival research, which means looking at the historical record. Uh, they added a very important component from actually French literary studies 
called semiotics. We'll talk about that. Semiotics means the science of signs um, and how we interpret the signs in any given situation. And they took another group of uh, methods from anthropology as it had developed, particularly what's called observational analysis. Um, in other words, rather than simply look at a book, let's look at what people are doing and see if we can make any sense of it. And they began to develop this um, discipline. And we can find all sorts of groups. There's a cultural studies group of Japan. There are schools that give degrees in cultural studies. Um, we have books. I just forgot to bring mine downstairs because Ray always borrows them for her research. Uh, and these all go in to form a discipline of cultural studies. So we'll spend about four or five weeks looking at some of the basic ideas and some of the basic methods so that we can then try to apply them to our own areas of research. Before we go on, everyone okay? Any questions? Cultural studies, written? Yeah. Okay. No. No problem. Okay, so look at the reading. It open. Uh, let's go over it. Uh, if I can find it. Where did I put the reading? Um, I forgot I'm on this stupid dumb uh, computer rather than a real computer. So looking at the opening of the reading, any questions? Did everyone, first off, my question, did everybody read it? I posted it on the Friedman project page. So everyone was able to find it? Yes? Did everyone, having found it, read it? Yes? Did everyone, having read it, understand it? Partly. Okay, so what part did we understand? Or are there questions? So we're back where we began. If there's parts that we didn't understand, the only way we do understand it is if we write or ask a question. Social construct signifiers. Yes? The Friedman Lab Members Project page. That's where I posted our reading for this week. No, no, not SFC. I'm going to get a credit. It's called Friedman Lab Members. It's uh, Yosuke said this is what we're going to use for our communication rather than a mailing group. And also, this is where. Uh, people like Richard or Sai are supposed to post. Well, I think some of the members are not at it because I am not. You're not at it? Okay, then we'll talk to Yosuke here. You can share with Yoshi or you can look at my tablet. It's called, the name of the page is Friedman Lab Members. Okay, we're not going to understand anything unless we ask questions about what's not clear. So, somebody said they sort of understood it. What didn't we understand? Uh, so, I know there's a lot of like stereotypes. Um, right. Like, like cultural stereotypes, right? But, how would we apply that to research when like, there's a lot of... Japan is a homogeneous nation where everybody is the same. It's been isolated for many hundreds of years so that it has a unified culture. Right. That's called an interior stereotype. 
it's been extended to being an exterior stereotype. If I begin to look at Japan, I find that almost none of that is true, even during the Tokugawa era. So, if I'm interested, I might do something like, why do people believe this? Where did this idea come from, and why do they believe it, and how is it used within contemporary Japanese culture? Let's take a more colloquial one. If I ask any of the students here, um, why don't you speak up in class and ask questions, what will they tell me? Japanese students are shocked. I mean, all 120 million people in the entire country are shocked. Major cultural, interior cultural stereotype. Why do we use it? What does it hide? It hides more complex core cultural terms like Japanese word for embarrassment and the idea that it, I don't want to be seen making a mistake in front of a group and we can begin to analyze that. Exterior stereotypes, okay. Um, Senkaku Islands, what are they? They're islands down by the islands in between Japan and Korea. And why are they important at the moment in the politics of East Asia? Uh, just it's because of the territorial, uh, the ocean territorial dispute between between Korea and Japan. Okay, so what do the Koreans say about the Japanese? But that the problem is the Japanese are uh, warlike and aggressive and blah 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 something from 80 years ago. Okay. Exterior stereotype that's continuing to affect political negotiations in East Asia. Uh, stereotype in the context of cultural studies simply means the term where we replace uh, an image for an examined reality of what's going on. And of course, the other side of stereotypes, why they have a bad image. Originally, a stereotype, the word stereotype simply meant an easy way to print a page. If I put out the whole page so it was set in printing before we had computers, it was simply called the stereotype. So I could make books more cheaply by creating a whole page rather than using movable print. This idea was taken when I stop moving things around in my mind and I simply take a frame and say, this is it, this is Japan, this is America, this is Korea. This is where the term stereotype began to be used in the English language. Within the context of cultural studies, we're not concerned with the positive, but we are concerned with positive or negative aspects of stereotype, which is the colloquial sense. It's when people are using a stereotype, it usually represents an important point that's hidden underneath. So this is what the section on stereotyping is about. Uh, but that's way at the bottom. If we look at the top, everyone okay where it begins? Cultural studies, social constructs, <coughs> signifiers, vocabulary okay? Social constructs. Social construct just what it sounds like. Something that's constructed socially. Okay. Uh, look around the room. Why are the males wearing clothes that are different from the females? None of the guys are wearing pretty blouses or earrings. Or little shoes with straps. Why not? social construct. Masculinity is not, gender is biological, right? It's X, Y, X, 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 Y, 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 um, genes. Beyond that, it's all socially constructed. What is a man supposed to be? What is a woman supposed to be? What clothes are they supposed to wear? What's their voice supposed to sound like? What are they supposed to do for a job? What are they supposed to do for a living? Almost everything in our life is socially constructed. There is an academic debate uh, that came out of 
cultural studies and went into an area called queer studies uh, in another seminar uh, that's called Essentialism versus Constructionism. Some researchers believe that there is an essential component to things. Um, that your genetics are not merely a predisposition but a determinant. That there are things like an essential identity for all human beings. Other thinkers, uh, largely from uh, deriving from a uh, French philosopher called Michel Foucault, say, no, absolutely everything is socially constructed. You can't show us anything that is not developed within a specific historical, cultural, and economic framework. So a co social construct is this particular frame or construct that helps us understand something, like gender in Japan, class in Japan. Well, what's the difference between otaku and salaryman? Those are both social constructs. And in fact, over time, the words both came into usage about the same time in Japanese. And over time, they've begun to blur as otaku becomes salary man, or at least become wealthy, and salary man become otaku. <coughs> so your social construct is how do we construct this identity? What does it mean? Answer the question. Everyone okay? Yes. Other questions? about the opening section? Everyone okay? Language, vocabulary? Is it everything okay? Okay. It's not an English class, but if the words, conversely, unlike an English class, I just use the direct academic terminology, so if the vocabulary is too hard, ask. Okay, so as we just said, cultural studies help discover how and why cultures are formed, the reason that groups of people act the way they do. It focuses on how people make meaning, comprehend reality, articulate values, arrange experiences through cultural symbols. Cultural study is the study of how a society creates and shares meaning. And this is what we're going to do if we're going to present Japan in some way, we have to be able to analyze how in the construct of Japan do people create and share meaning. So they do. Okay. A good way to begin to understand some of the basic ideas in cultural studies is to look at some of the key figures whose ideas uh, became important components within the area of cultural studies. So our first figure is a man named Ferdinand de Saussure, who's a Swiss professor, and he's the guy who coined the term and developed the idea of semiotics, and semiotic analysis. So did everyone read or look up Ferdinand de Saussure? Obviously he has a huge article on Wikipedia, much longer than the one paragraph I chose, um, I, I put in here. <coughs> Any questions about Ferdinand de Saussure? What's the difference between semiotic and literature? Semiotic literature? Semiotics is like um, people? Uh, semiotics literally means the science of signs. Um, yeah. Um, you're driving a car. You see a big red light. What do you do? Stop. Why? It doesn't say stop. It's a science of signs. You're driving and you see this, what do you do? Stop. Why? Okay, let's make it more complex. You're walking out of class and you see one boy and he's wearing the old school uniform. And you see another boy and he's wearing a suit and tie. And you see another boy and he's wearing really baggy pants and a, back, and a backward baseball cap. Tell me about these three boys. What do you know about them? The guy who's wearing the old school uniform. Who is he? Um, junior high school student. Well, no, here at the university. Uh, here. Uh, okay. He's probably on a sports team. 
How do you know that? Does he have a big sign? I'm on a sports team. Uh, the guy who's wearing a suit and tie. Uh, senior okay. Do we want? Okay. Probably on job search. Well, what about the guy with baggy pants and a backward hat? Baseball cap. Who's he? Um, he belongs to the hip hop band circle. Uh, See, oh, you assume that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Do they have a big sign? None of them have a sign. We read the signs that are embedded in our culture, in this case, <coughs> clothes, which are one of the huge signifiers. This is what is meant by semiotics. Made cosplaying girls who serve people who go there. Why? Why do we have cafes where uh, women dress up in strange French made outfits that no French maid ever wore? to serve coffee to people. And why would anyone pay money to go there? It's the customer's dream world. Dream world from what? That animation project. Okay. So we're at the beginning of semiotics. We go into a room. We see a bunch of waitresses wearing short black dresses, little aprons, funny little hats, shoes. They're serving people. Um, it would be easy to just say, OK, this is some weird fantasy, but in reality, these are all signifiers, signs, of animation culture. What, what, which specific animation culture? That's where we start into cultural studies. So we look up the different manga that created the French maid character, we talk about cosplay, we look at the Comic-Con conventions, and we see that it's not an individual phenomenon, it's not even only in Akihabara, it's a very complex set of symbols and signifiers in which the participants understand what's going on, but observers may not, which identifies it as a subculture rather than a culture. Um, so that's how we apply semiotics into the research that we might want to do. We pick French maid bars, but we could just as easily pick student circles, or McDonald's, or anything else, and apply the tools that we're going to talk about. Any other questions? Everyone okay? Okay, so Ferdinand Saussure, he came at the beginning of the 20th century. <coughs> he was focusing on language and developed semiotics, but a little later on, another French professor, his name is Claude was Claude Levi Strauss. Uh, he uh, began to apply some of these ideas to his area, which is anthropology. So, what is anthropology? What is the area called anthropology? What do you, what do you study? Human. Human beings. So, classical anthropology uh, has developed largely in Britain and Germany because of colonialism was, okay, we go out and we watch a bunch of natives doing things and we take notes and we come back and say, primitive people wear this or do that. Uh, Claude Levi Strauss said, this is not a useful way of really doing anthropology. We need to look at not whether primitive people are dancing, but look at the structure and apply semiotics, in a sense, to our observations. So this is an area that's sometimes called structuralism. So he wrote a famous book called Structural Anthropology. He considers the culture a system of symbolic communications. So if we're communicating symbolically, if I can't read the symbols, I'm never going to understand it, whether it's a dance or a French-made cafe. Um, he felt that you could use this method um, better than simply analyzing uh, on the surface uh, novels or political speeches or other things. His research represented a departure uh, from the standard functionalist explanation. Um, a bar is for drinking. A movie is for viewing. This is functional. And uh, we don't have, well, you read all of this. so. Uh, Levi Strauss's alternative 
was to develop what's called a socio-historical analysis, accounting for the existence of what we call social artifacts by studying how it came to be. He applied tools from these other fields to studying culture. And we talked about some of these tools. Number one is archival. We read primary or secondary, ideally primary sources. What is the background for the cultural object? Um, what do we mean by understanding primary sources and a cultural object? Um, if I'm walking around any Japanese town, I'll see a funny little cement statue that often has a little red apron and a little red hat. What is it? They're often by the side of the road. It's a little statue, about, usually about so high. What are they? Start with structural. What are they called? about, let's see, one, two, three, about four different jizo that are stuck there by the side of the road. Why are they there? Where did they come from? I, maybe. We don't know. The point isn't that you have to answer me. The point is that if I apply Claude Levi Strauss theories. I don't just say, okay, they're, uh, which is what most observers would say, they're images that are set up to represent dead children or the spirits of dead children. This would imply everyone in Japan does this, which they don't. Where do they come from? Did they come from Buddhism? Do they come from Shintoism? Did they come from an older religion? How do I find out? I do what's called archival research. I don't simply say, this is a jizo and it represents dead children. I do historical research. When did jizo start, first started appearing in Japan? Um, where, what were they associated with? How did they come to represent the death of children now? So if I go to uh, Kamakura, to what is it, Hasegera, it's all filled with the little Tizo plastic statues, not the expensive uh, stone statues. So archival research means I look at something, and before I do anything else, I do background research information. Not as hard as it sounds, I mean, unless I'm going to be Claude Levi Strauss. If I go to Wikipedia and I type in Japan flash J-I-Z-O, an article will come up that will give me some of the background and links to go to the next place. But cultural artifacts are not simply historical, deep historical artifacts. There are all sorts of historical, uh, I'm sorry, cultural artifacts that I could talk about in any uh, given construct. Um, originally, when we said, what is the guy in the old school uniform, uh, Mizuki said it's a junior high school student. Why? Why a junior high school student? And where does the uniform come from? Why do junior high school students wear those rather ugly polyester black coats? After all, it's only private schools like Keio that have our students wearing the even more silly blazers like I had to wear. Most schools People wear those sort of ugly black coats. Why? Again, archival research. If I type in what's the Japanese word for school uniform? <laughs> or dakura. Type in dakura and see what comes up. What will come up is 
a number of articles will all say standard public school uniform for Japan. It was adopted from the Prussian school uniform when Japan reformed education in the Meiji era. And then we could research why out of all the countries to adopt their school uniforms, why did Japan choose Prussia? This is what's meant by archival research. All of these things have fairly easy answers with a moderate amount of research. Okay. Clear what we mean by archival research of a cultural artifact? What is it? Where did it come from? We don't, we don't assume a stereotype. We research the background. Okay, observational. That's going to be our homework. Speaks for itself. We don't say, well, uh, French made cafes are filled with otaku and this is their dream world. We go to a French made cafe and we say, who's there? How are they dressed? What are they doing? If possible, we interview people. This comes from classic anthropology. Anthropologists are supposed to physically go where they're going to observe and try to use the tools, hopefully deeper tools than classical anthropologists, to analyze and report what they found at that particular site. Um, again, you could, we're going to do some homework, and you can see there, how many people here go to Shonendok to go home? How many people have gone to Dutour Coffee in Shonendai? How many people go to Starbucks Coffee? Are they the same? Really, the coffee is substantially different? So what's the difference between coffee cultures and Shonendai? Only way we can tell? Go and observe. Who's at Starbucks? What are they doing? What's the space? Who's at Dutour? What are they doing? What's the space? This is what's meant by Observational anthropology, it's actually called an ethnography or ethnographic observation. We go and we look and we make notes and we report. So archival, tool number one, number two, observational, and three, cultural. Once I have my observations, what do they mean? So if I see a bunch of kids all wearing the black uniform, what does that mean? Uh, probably they're public middle school students. Uh, if I see a bunch of people hanging out, I look at them and I say, okay, how are they dressed? What are they doing? Why are they here? What's going on? What's up now? Need some hip hop. Mm -hmm. Need the tripod. Well, the, he's filming upstairs right now. But okay. So, the tools that Claude Levi Strauss brought to us were don't, don't simply start with a stereotype. We do the background research. Second, we have accurate observation of what it is we're looking at. <coughs> Finally, we can then move. And instead of simply saying, okay, there are a bunch of natives dancing around a fire, we try to use semiotics and understand what communication is taking place by analyzing the signs and the signifiers in the area that we're observing. So this is from Claude Levi Strauss and his concept of structural anthropology. Well, okay. Any questions? Okay, so far so good, but it leaves us with a problem because if I'm an observer and um, I do my archival research, maybe I assume people in the Gakuran are all middle school students, but maybe they belong to a sports club. Or maybe they're all otaku taking part in cosplay. How am I going to find out? Well, this is added, this is where another teacher who actually only died uh, last year, yeah. A man named Stuart Hall, and he developed the concept, or didn't develop, but clarified the concept of what we call culture codes. Every culture, every subculture, has its own code. Uh, if we understand 
not simply the mechanics of the code, in other words, the signs, but how the information moves within the group, then we can come to a better understanding of the culture code and how it works in any given situation. Um, so Stuart Hall uh, sort of came up with a six-step encoding, decoding process that he talks about. And the first steps are production. Somebody produces something. Um, why someone produces something is not always how someone interprets something. Um, we'll do a piece of homework with this, but you heard me mention, what is it? Acute High Earth Self Defense Club, right? Have you, any of you watched it? Know it? Why do you think they made it? Why did the producers make it? That one should be an easy one. Why do people who make programs, MMA, etc., why do they make anything? What's their goal? Because there isn't like an MMA or popular culture. That would certainly be true if they were fans making it, but why does a company make it and produce it? What's the goal of a company? Simple, you know it. Why does a company do anything? To make money, of course. So the production here, to make money. They don't care. The producers probably don't care who watches it and how it goes out. This is what we mean by the step of production. Why do the makers make what they're making? Are they doing it to make money? Are they doing it to influence people? Are they doing it to uh, comment on society? Are they doing it to change society? This is Cute Earth High Self Defense Club, something. As you notice, it's in Japanese, but already, what does it have underneath it? The Japanese. Kimaku. Why? If it's an anime made for money and it's in Japanese, Can you see this? Or? Yes, 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 yes. Can you hear it?
Anyway, uh, if you decide to analyze this, uh, I think they have the first season episodes. Interestingly, along with just the raw episodes, there's the whole first season already with English subtitles. Why? Because the producers premiered the anime before it premiered in Japan, before they started producing the manga, <coughs> in Sydney, Australia, and Los Angeles. Why Sydney, Australia, and Los Angeles? Sydney, Australia should be obvious. Yeah, because of the Wombat. And Los Angeles, because it's the otaku capital of the world outside of Tokyo. It's where Comic-Con home, home planet is. So the producers were producing something with the intent of making money. And they put it in the widest possible venue with their g -Monku. But let's look at step two. Um, after production, we have circulation. How individuals perceive things, visual versus written, how things are circulated influences how audience members respond. So the people making this, they were looking for the widest possible audience to make the most possible money. In Japan, how do we choose our manga or anime? Do we, does everybody watch all anime or all manga? No. Uh, Otakudom in Japan is very specific. It doesn't take an expert to look at this and say, okay, this is a male version of Sailor Moon, uh, which is for high school girls, so I'm not going to read it. But in America, when this is circulating, there might be an entirely different reaction. And in fact, if we go to YouTube and do observational analysis, we can already find tons of reviews, none of which hit on the idea that it's Sailor Moon, most of which try to discuss, is this serious or not serious? How is this coming out of Japan? Is it supposed to be a joke? So the producer produces, but as something circulates, the meaning changes as it moves through an audience, through different cultures. So Stuart Hall identified production. He identified circulation. Reproduction. And this is the stage after the audience members have interpreted the message in their own way. Um, so we look at something and we try to give it meaning. But the meaning that we give it is not always the same meaning that was meant by the producer. Uh, let's see if we can find uh, one of those. Let's see. Where are the old sayers? Issue in here. Uh, Here is an example of reproduction. Here's a guy who has a YouTube channel, that an Otaku YouTube channel in English. guy who has a YouTube channel in English. So, 
this is what's meant by reproduction. This guy looks at it, and he assumes that this whole anime is a satire. That's not at all the intent of the producers. Their producer was, let's produce something to make money. So, Stuart Hall outlines these steps. We produce something. We circulate something. But once we circulate it, its meaning can change, and the reproduction will then renew the steps of the culture code. At each point in the steps, Stuart Hall says, we have to be aware of what's going on, otherwise we'll misinterpret, misunderstand culture, and create stereotypes. Um, everyone okay so far? I know I've been breezing over this. Stuart Hall, any questions, vocabulary? Okay, so what are some of the significant applications of cultural studies uh, that we can look at? Um, obviously, we were talking about stereotyping. Um, stereotypes, we usually think of them as bad when they come into areas like racism. Um, in an inter or a better transcultural setting, uh, it's important to think about stereotypes from many different points of view. From an academic, analytical point of view of understanding something to a business point of view of having a successful venture. So further on, I think I mentioned a classic failure. Um, how many people have been to Tokyo Disneyland? Did you enjoy it? It's a successful venture as far as the producers are concerned. It makes lots of money, gets lots of visitors. What about Euro Disneyland outside of Paris? What happened to it? Anyone know? Went bankrupt. And the analysis in the after fact had a lot to do with what we now call culture codes and cultural studies. In Europe, Cinderella's castle looks pathetic. If you've never been to Europe, I suppose what Walt Disney built in Southern California uh, seems fantastic. But if you've looked in a picture book at Castle Neuwastein in Bavaria, you know that it looks pretty silly, like a Legoland or something. If you're in Paris, you don't have to go very far to see a castle. So that's not going to work. The whole image of the princess, etc., seemed like an insult when we Americanize all the classic European tales, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, it seems an uh, egregious insult to the European cultures. So it wasn't successful. And more importantly, the space itself as an area to attract visitors did not appeal to the European sense of leisure. So failure to read culture codes led to a major failure in their business plan. So culture codes and cultural analysis is something that started in academia, but now uh, goes far beyond academia. We can find consultancies uh, where people uh, actually use their skills to help businesses in culture codes. And I gave you a couple of the uh, URLs, I think. Uh, or, you know, uh, yeah, there you go, Cultural, culturalanalysis.com. If you visit that site, you'll see one of the consultancy companies that will help people place their product um, without some of the cultural uh, issues that are standing in the way. Um, before we go on, everyone okay? Any questions? Anything you want to ask about? Okay, then let me ask you, if you hit the blog that says, My Modern Net Profiles Blog, 20 Eye-Opening Cultural Norms, you'll find somebody's analysis. They're saying that these items represent cultural norms in Japan. And they offer their analysis, not a particularly academic one. So, take a minute, get a partner or partners, Go over the 20 eye-opening cultural norms. Question number one, are they accurate? Are these indeed cultural norms in our opinion? 
Question number two, is their analysis correct or incorrect? Question number three, um, do you think this will lead to stereotyping or will it just lead to huge misconceptions and a business error? Everyone able to access, it's this URL? Like this? Yeah. Okay. So get a partner or partners or if you all want to work together, it's only five, there are 20 norms. Do you understand what I'm asking you to do? Go to work. have you been to, Yusuke? The United States. So have you ever been to a train station or a bus station or a news stand in the U.S.? Uh, only in New York. How are the papers stacked? Wow. Uh, I don't remember. Flat maybe? Maybe. <laughs> so if they're not stacked the same way, this is, this is what is meant by cultural studies. So we start with we don't have time for the archival research of newsstands, but we can go directly to Claude Levi Strauss and observational analysis and structural anthropology. If I go someplace and I see, okay, the newsstands here, all the papers are wrapped and stacked in these sort of towers, and I go someplace else and they're all flat, why? It doesn't save space one way or the other unless I can really prove that they do. That's my theory. Then I have to do the analysis to prove it. What would be the reason for stacking them differently? So as we read this guy, what does he say? We don't have to come up with our answers yet. We may not be researching new stance. But we look at his analysis and decide, is it accurate? of the observation. Reasonable.
other, come up with your best idea? Well, the explanations on the uh, article, I think it's probably accurate. And another reason that it's sealed, I think, is that like Japanese people want to buy something clean, like something new, like untouched. Okay, so take that concept. So is that accurate? They want something clean? Why? How clean is a newspaper? I feel like that's a little different because there's a lot of like, like, for example, book off, right? We mm -hmm. have used books that are sold for very cheap mm -hmm. prices and a lot of people go there and get those books because it's cheap. Because it's cheaper and they're out of the wrapper. Right. Which then brings up the question, why add to, why do producers in Japan add to their unit cost by putting it in a wrapper? In other words, if I'm a publisher, I could lower the price of my unit by simply not wrapping it. Why do I wrap it and raise the price of my unit? Then we have to look at concepts like cleanliness. He might not have analyzed it well, but we would have to say what role do things like this play? Not the reality, but the belief. This is what's meant by cultural studies. How do I think about cleanliness and non-cleanliness in any given society? So keep on going. What else is there? Work together. Come up with your best. I always think of the ATM interface. Because if you go like the states, right? You have an ATM. You pay for that one. They don't really have those. They just don't have it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to bow on any people, right? Japanese used to, did they count with pinkies, right? Oh, 
Yeah. 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 seen someone counting this way, is it really a cultural norm? Or is it a misapprehension from a single observation? Simply because someone writes something in a book or an article doesn't make it true, what, we're, what part of the purpose of this exercise is, we look at somebody's observation and then we ask ourselves, is this truly an accurate observation as a cultural norm? If you don't count that way, and you don't count that way, how many other people don't count that way? So we would assume that his, the observation for this article was conducted someplace where he decided this was significant enough. Maybe it's an age construct. Maybe it's a space construct. We don't have to analyze it. What we have to do is say, oops, we think this is inaccurate. They didn't observe enough and deeply which is the important lesson if we're going to do cultural studies, to observe deeply and significantly, and not on a surface manner and only one time. about clean and dirty spaces, because here's a significant one. We know that his observation may be correct, but this is a classic example of cultural studies that most people don't think about, and it can show how the gap between truly an analyzing and stereotype can easily develop. Every culture has very strict rules between clean and dirty, uh, inside, outside. This is universal in human culture. They're not all the same. What one culture considers inside or outside may differ in the other culture. His observation is <coughs> correct, uh, but if we take his observation and we apply it on a transcultural level, then we can see if somebody from Japan goes to some place where they don't have toilet shoes, or vice versa, then stereotypes begin to develop. Oh, Japan is a clean society because we have toilet shoes, or Japan is a weird society because they have toilet shoes. The goal of cultural studies is to understand and move beyond stereotypes by looking at what are called core cultural values and how these values express themselves within the cultural communication of a given construct. Um, in, has anyone here ever traveled to a country with an Islamic culture? Yeah, yeah. in Malaysia. Uh -huh. Do we use our left hand for anything? Yeah. Well, that's true, in Malaysia it would be different, but in the Mideast, never. Yeah. We, we don't shake with our left hand, we don't use our left hand for eating, we only use it for one thing. So a very strict separation, just like in Japan between 
clean and dirty. The left hand is dirty. The right hand is not dirty. It's a Islamic culture? In many Islamic cultures, and particularly in Middle Eastern cultures. So, even if I'm left-handed, I don't shake with my left hand. I certainly don't eat with my left hand. Um, there's a reason for this, that we don't need to go into it. The, what we're looking at in cultural studies, unless we're interested in researching, would be what is, how do people interpret clean and dirty? How does it work in this culture? How does it work in another culture? And what are the signs of it in the different cultures? And how is it interpreted? This is what cultural studies mean. Uh, of course, it becomes useful, so we'll look at a book next week for business people that gives us all of these points in little tiny sentences for people, business people who apparently can't read, saying, don't shake with your left hand, or don't wear your shoes into the toilet. But for the research purposes, what this shows is the basic idea that we're talking about. Core cultural values express themselves symbolically. If we're going to explain culture, analyze culture, present culture, we need to have the tools to examine the cultural values and be able to explain how they work. Um, everyone okay? Any questions? We are going to run out of time in a little bit and I want to go on to our homework. So if you go back up on our page, you'll see our homework for this week, you're going to do structural anthropology and analysis, coffee cultures in Shonandai, or if you don't live in Shonandai, someplace else. So choose two coffee houses like Dutour and Starbucks. What is coffee? Simply ground up coffee beans and hot water. There's no substantial difference between hot water and ground up coffee beans on the west side of the station or the north side of the station, whatever it is. I'm sorry, west and east. And yet, if we observe, we might find substantial differences. So your job is, step number one, observe, not once, but multiple times. Between today and next Friday, as you pass through Shodandai, Go to the tour two or three times. And then on alternate days, visit Starbucks at similar times, more than once. As you go there, observe who's there. What are they doing? Just the things that we're talking about. Are they men or women? How old are they? What kind of clothes are they wearing? Uh, what else are they doing? What are they eating? What are they drinking? You look for structural artifacts. Is the cup of coffee the same price at Dutour as it is at Starbucks? Are there other things? Is the space being used the same way? Does the space look the same? So you'll take all of your notes from your observations. You'll put your notes together, and then you'll analyze them. Well, if there are differences, what do the differences represent? Why do you think there are these differences between these two places? Or if they're the same, why are they the same? So, that's our homework. You'll come in next week and you'll give a report to the group. And we'll try to analyze coffee culture in Starbucks using the tools of cultural studies. See if we can come up with an idea. Okay? Clear? Okay. And that's enough for today. And we'll hear our report next time and then we'll have Another assignment and another reading for, well actually we don't get any golden.